Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, this week is pre recorded. So, if you do have any questions, if you're on Zoom, you can just reply to the confirmation email you got for your Zoom meeting invite. And I'll, those will go to my email inbox. You can uh, just email me your question, I'll get back to you. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can just comment underneath the video and I will check those as well. And if you're watching this on Facebook, same thing, comment underneath the video and I will get to those questions uh, throughout the week. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last nine years or so, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. So I had about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I worked in a Subaru dealership and over time, I guess, just became that dyad guy in the shop. So always ended up with the intermittent problems, the drivability problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come in my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic today is electric vehicles operation and testing. So this is gonna be a high level overview of electric vehicles, the different components involved, because there are some differences, of course, we're operating on electricity versus operating on gasoline. So there are some difference in there. And uh, if, you, if you watched our hybrid class, you'll also notice a lot of similarities between the hybrid vehicle and electric vehicle. So it's, it's a good transition to go from your gasoline to your gas electric hybrid to a full electric vehicle. A lot of similar type components in there. I'll tell you what though, on the EV vehicle, the electric vehicle, it has a way bigger battery for sure. And it seems like this is really the way that manufacturers are taking it. Not that they're totally getting rid of gasoline engines or diesel engines, but they definitely see that there is a want for this in the market and they are going to provide. So if we look at the current market right now, and this is uh, early 2022 when we're doing this. So uh, here's a, just a smattering of the, mod, uh, the models. I picked up you know, the Mustang Mach-E that's been out for a little while. Uh, at Volvo XC40 recharge, I'm seeing that pop up a lot in my uh, Facebook feed, uh, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Polestar, which is one of those that that's, that's all they do is electric vehicles. Same with Rivian, they have uh, trucks that they do. Uh, even an electric Mini Cooper even. Uh, Nissan Leaf's been around for quite some time. Uh, Hyundai Kona Electric also, I'm actually gonna focus on uh, a bit of that vehicle today just because there's a lot of information available. They make a lot of information available for it uh, just so, to help you explain how, how a lot of these systems work very similarly to each other. Uh, another big one there is the Hummer, Hummer EV. So uh, GMC is bringing back the Hummer. And I'll tell you what, that is a big, heavy truck. The, the, the weight on that truck is supposed to be 9,000 pounds and a thousand of it's the battery. Uh, so that is a big, heavy truck, uh, but it does some cool stuff. And uh, you know, I, I guess there is definitely a market for it. But as far as electric vehicles coming soon that are not even out yet over the next two, three years, Audi's got a couple more models coming in. Uh, BMW's got three more. Buick's coming uh, out in electric car as well. Cadillac's got a couple. Chevy's going all in. GM is going all in. They said there's going to be over 35 different models with an, at least an electric option, not necessarily full electric, but uh, have that as one of the options for the vehicle. Uh, Ford with the F-150 Lightning. Don't know if you saw that. You know, it's got a system in there where I can Instead of charging the vehicle from my house, I can charge the house from my vehicle. I thought that was kind of an interesting little take on it as well. Jeep's getting into the game with the Wrangler. Mercedes seems to be going all in as well. They're putting a lot of, uh, lot of vehicles out on the street there. Porsche as well. Uh, Subaru's getting in the game with Solterra. Uh, Volvo's got a couple more that they're coming out with. Volkswagen as well, Toyota. So just about every manufacturer that's out there, that's your more mainline manufacturers, they are coming out with an electric vehicle. So they are definitely out there and, and or they're definitely on the horizon for sure. So uh, there are some pros and cons. I'm sure you've heard different things about electric vehicles, but you know, think about pros. If it's an electric motor, it's pretty much instant torque right off the line and the torque curve is much more manageable. I don't have to worry about uh, other variables in there. Pretty quiet. There's actually vehicles out there that they have a noise generator for when it's backing up or something like that. So the pedestrians can be aware that it's even moving. So 
it is very quiet. Smooth acceleration because of that torque curve, it, it just kind of goes and, and it's able to accelerate just pretty much as fast as you can turn the motor. Zero emissions of zero tailpipe emissions, of course. Uh, not relying on fluctuating fuel prices. So we don't have to worry about the gas price of gas going up or going down. Um, price of electricity, fairly stable, fairly stable. I know my electric bill goes up every once in a while, but it's not, it, it's more manageable, right? Than having a, a dollar swing in gas over a month and a half. Uh, reliability, since I don't have internal combustion engine components to worry about, you know, I don't have to worry about oil changes, things like that. So we're, that's where we get to that low maintenance there as well. So there are a lot of pros, some cons though as well. And you just got to kind of weigh them out, right? So weight, as I said, can be pretty heavy. The battery itself is usually around a thousand pounds or so. Uh, limited range, they are getting better. They say in the industry, they say the magic number for people wanting to be willing to buy an electric car is about 350 miles or so. And we seem to be hitting that sweet spot on a lot of these newer vehicles. They, they seem to be get, able to get that 350 mile range or more out of it. So I, I'm sure the, the further you can go, the better. Because as of right now, at least early 2022, limited charging infrastructure out there. So there's chargers, charging stations out there, but it's not like a gas station on every corner that you'd be used to with an internal combustion engine, right? So it is limited in that scope. Plus, it takes a little while to charge the vehicle. I can't just sit there for five minutes and have 100% charge like I can sit there five minutes at my gas tank and have a full tank of gas. So there's a little bit of ways to go, I would say, but it, it's it's definitely this promise. Uh, it can be expensive. The battery technology and the electric motors and everything, those can be pretty pricey. And we're going to see the price of a battery here uh, a little bit later when we go live. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little mind boggling how much these batteries can be. Once again, if you remember back, to, if you took our uh, hybrid course as well, high voltage can be dangerous. So if you're working on it, you do need to take many special precautions, make sure you don't get injured or worse, and environmental impacts as well. So I, I know you've probably heard about how do we make these batteries? How do we have to get the materials and lithium mines, things like that. So there can be environmental impacts. And then you also have to think about, well, what happens to the battery when it is discharging and can no longer be used anymore? I'm sure there's ways to recycle some of it, but I'm sure all of it can't be recycled. So there can be environmental impacts there but it's just what they, you have to weigh it out. And then also parts replacement costs. We're gonna see, as I said, price of a battery. So if my battery fails, how much is it gonna to cost to replace that part on this vehicle? So hopefully manufacturers will pay attention and, and, and do some good warranties on that, I think. Uh, Cause I certainly wouldn't wanna pay for a, uh, a replacement battery when it's, when it's uh, in warranty anyway. So um, definitely some considerations there. You gotta weigh out the pros versus the cons. I'm sure if you're, you're city driving around town, it could be a great option for you. If you're, if you're trying to drive across country, not sure if you have quite the range yet, but hey, we're getting there. And at least they're making the attempt, right? So let's talk about the different components. Of course, we have the main star of the show, which is the battery. And that takes up the most of the weight and most of the, uh, you know, that that's your electric storage device. Uh, also battery cooling and heating because they do have to cool and heat the battery. There's a voltage conversion system of some sort in there because we have to go from DC to AC and back to DC and such. So uh, we have that involved. There's a regenerative braking system, much like on a hybrid vehicle. A lot of electric vehicles followed suit and use that electric motor to help charge the battery when we're braking. The electric motor itself, of course, and since it is an electric vehicle, all electric, doesn't have an engine, uh, we have to worry about the charger too. So a charger at the house or a charger somewhere else with the charging ports. And of course, before we go too far, we need to talk about safety. Now this is from a hybrid vehicle safety checklist, but it, it still holds true for electric vehicles as well. Uh, high voltage can kill you. So you wanna be sure you're being very safe, follow manufacturer's directions. There are service plugs on these vehicles that you need to pull out before you attempt any repairs. Uh, that's kind of like, a, a, I had one, uh, one person comment on the hybrid video that uh, we, they do lockout tag out procedures pretty much. Or another person said, oh, I just put the, put the plug in my pocket. That way I can make sure nobody else is going to plug it in unexpectedly. Also, we have to wait, wait for the high voltage system to discharge fully because there's capacitors in there. We have to wait for them to bleed down. So the high voltage system may remain powered for up to 10 minutes after the vehicle is shut off or disabled. 
to prevent serious injury or death from severe burns or electric shock. Avoid touching, cutting, or opening any orange high voltage power cable or high voltage component. Um, they are insulated from the chassis, so you know, they shouldn't have to worry about any shock when touching the metal chassis, unless of course there's a problem in there, but that would stop electricity flow as well. There's also safety measures, relays there uh, for ground faults. And also if there's vehicles in a collision, it will disconnect the high voltage system from the rest of the vehicle and make it safer than uh, if we didn't do that. That, that, that could cause uh, some serious issues there. So it does stop electricity flow in a collision uh, to activate the supplementary restraint systems. First off, let's talk to the battery. So a battery in this case is a bunch of little batteries all wired together in series. So it's, it's multiple small three to seven volt or so little DC batteries and they just link them all together in series, make one big old battery that can result in a high DC voltage of over 400 volts possibly, just depends on how many batteries they put in there. Uh, they can be nickel metal hydride or lithium ion type batteries. Uh, there's other manufacturers out there working on different formulations uh, just because of, uh, uh, apparently there's a nickel shortage out there as well. So they're thinking about doing different things uh, with different formulations in there. Uh, but mainly what you're gonna see is nickel metal hydride or lithium ion out there. And the EVs do have large packs, very large can fill up the whole entire bottom of the vehicle because well, we don't have to put anything else in there. We don't need a fuel tank or anything. So this is the fuel tank for the car. So it can be quite heavy. If you ever do need to remove one of these from the vehicle, like I said, luckily they are usually on the bottom, but you need a specialized you know, lifting structure, table sort of thing to be able to drop that out of the vehicle. So this is out of a uh, out of Hyundai there. And you see, it takes up most of the floor pan. This is the entire battery's in here. This is an uh, armored cover, but it's in here, it's, it's underneath. We also need to think about heating and cooling because batteries operate the best when they're at a certain temperature, whatever the manufacturer decides that temperature needs to be to maximize their performance and their life. So three methods are used much like on a hybrid vehicle. We have the three different methods. We have passive air cooling, which I don't think on EVs seem to be as widespread uh, just because it's a bigger battery and we need more airflow to cool it. So usually it's an active air cooling, maybe more like a fan or liquid cooling as well is pretty popular in there. So you can see this is on an Audi vehicle and we have uh, uh, all the different components there. And most of this is the uh, cooling circuit right there. There's also a heater circuit in there as well. So if we look over here, this is on a uh, Hyundai. Uh, liquid cooling can also warm the battery if needed. Cause as we said, if it's very, very cold out we would need to warm the battery. If it's very, very hot, the battery we need to cool it off. So it can do both. If there are, if we are using coolant to cool the battery, we wanna make sure it has deionized water. You can't just throw 50-50 in there and, and call it a day because non-deionized water, I guess you'd call that ionized water or regular tap water uh, would be, can be conductive because it has ions in it. So it can be conductive and we don't wanna do that because we're running it through the batteries. So we don't wanna, uh, we wanna have deionized water. in there. And as we said, it could be either warmed or chilled depending on what we have going on. And it is an electric water pump that runs off the big battery. And it also has a radiator, just like an internal combustion engine vehicle, this vehicle would have a radiator as well. Uh, so we see a reservoir tank here, a couple three-way valves because we have chillers and heaters. Uh, there's a heater battery module as well. And then we have a couple other ECUs, which are also cooled. The motor itself is also cooled. The charger is cooled. So lots of cooling going on underneath the, uh, the vehicle with the different systems involved. So we're cooling off the computers, we're cooling off the batteries themselves. And then we also have a radiator and a radiator fan, oftentimes up in the front. They can they can kind of play with the configuration. It doesn't necessarily have to be straight up and down, I guess, because we don't have an engine up there. And if you've seen many of these electric cars, they don't even have a grill anyways. Uh, so they just have to direct the air some other way. But um, yeah, we'll have very similar in the way it works. It just It just happens to be an electric water pump in there that runs off the big battery. Then we also have to talk about conversion and inversion. Uh, so as I said, this a lot of this is from Hyundai. So it, a lot of manufacturers will use a very similar type system. They're all fairly, fairly similar in how they operate. So in this case, we have a 360 volt high voltage battery, which goes to a high voltage joint box. And then there's a control ECU in there for AC conversion, DC high voltage, and it also converts to DC low voltage to help out the auxiliary battery. Because yes, it does still have 
a 12 volt battery in there to run everything else on the car that you would be used to. The only real difference between an electric vehicle and a not electric vehicle is the engine and the high voltage system. So if I discount the high voltage, don't even think about that high voltage system and the high voltage electric motor, it's a normal car. I got a body control module, I got airbags, I got analog brakes, I have all the different systems on a vehicle, maybe not the transmission either, but I have all the other systems, HVAC, radio, navigation, seats, seat warmers, seat coolers, all these different functions that I would have on a non-electric vehicle, I still have on the electric vehicle. So if you think about, you can work on any other system the same way that you would normally work on a combustion engine vehicle. So Really, the main difference is the high voltage and the electric motor instead of a gas. Another schematic on this converter inverter. So we have uh, the vehicle control unit, uh, the, yeah, the voltage control unit. And then we have the, the low, low DC converter. And then we have high voltage there. There's a, there's a control module there, brake switch, shift lever, all these inputs go in here. Uh, also battery management system, available battery power goes there and state of charge information goes there and it also allows it to switch. So there's a lot of sophisticated electronics that we don't really need to get too deep into, just know it's got a big old computer in there and that does the job um, of controlling where that voltage goes and how it works. And if you do have a problem, you'll get a failure code just like any other issue on a vehicle and then you would diagnose it accordingly according to the manufacturer's flow chart. And then we have the regenerative braking system. So what that does is it transfers energy from braking. So my kinetic energy, my heat energy from braking and uses it to charge the battery. Essentially, a, simplest, a simplified way of explaining it is it uses the electric motor like an engine brake. So, in, it, so say, say you shift into a lower gear, went to decelerate on a manual vehicle, manual transmission vehicle, same type of thing. So in that case, the motor becomes a generator because all it is is just an AC motor. So it becomes an AC generator, one running the other way. And it then sends the voltage back into the battery. Also, hydraulic brakes are still used on the vehicle. So you still have brake pads, you still have calipers, you still have discs and all that. Um, but it's not used until you come down to a, a, a complete stop or if in a panic stop emergency type situation, that would also be uh, where those hydraulic brakes would, be, would come into play. But it tries to use the engine or the motor, should I say, we have to rethink what we call these things. So the motor uses the motor to charge that battery as much as possible. And then we have the electric motor itself. So this is an electric motor assembly out of a Hyundai Kona electric vehicle. Uh, they use these in a couple of their different electric vehicles, pretty much a similar package. Here's the actual motor itself right there. Uh, there's some reduction gears in here. There's battery management systems, charging modules. All of it is kind of just put on this electric motor and it makes it about the same size and, and shape as a internal combustion engine, which makes it really easy if they do this manufacturers to swap out, well, take my engine out, put my electric motor assembly in. And if it mounts the same, then it saves some cost as well. Uh, so it is used to drive the wheels, of course. High AC voltage could be 500 volts plus on some models. Like I said, used to drive the wheels, used to charge the battery during the regenerative braking process. So as, as we said, it turns into a generator and most are three phase AC. So if we were to look at a wiring diagram, which we will, uh, we'll see that we have three phases of AC in here. So as I said, we have the motor assembly itself. We have a reduction gear over here. This is a high voltage junction box. So that's that voltage converter. This is the onboard charging system monitor computer assembly and then we have the electronic power control unit here as well uh, this is just kind of a really fancy engine mount over here so the main motor is right here the electric motor um, and then that's what drives the wheels the wheel, wheels come off just like on a uh, on a transaxle so we have a, a reduction gear assembly over here and the axles come out just like on an automatic transaxle or manual transaxle on a transverse mounted engine it's very very similar in look and kind of similar in how it acts as well. So most or many, should I say, many electric motors that are out there right now use what we call a permanent magnet synchronous motor. This works very similar to if you've ever seen how a, uh, a brushless DC motor works. 
I actually have a, a class on that for brushless fuel pumps. So what it does is the, we have the rotor in the middle with permanent magnets on it. And then the stator is stationary and we have these windings and the AC voltage generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic, magnetic field is used to drive this rotor around by uh, go, go operating opposite of the permanent magnet polarity. Um, so both feature permanent magnets on the rotor and the field windings in the stator between the brushless DC and, the, and this uh, permanent magnet synchronous motor. So very similar. The key difference is instead of using DC current and switching various windings on and off uh, to spin the magnets, then this permanent magnet synchronous motor functions on continuous sinusoidal AC current. That means it suffers no torque ripple and needs only one Hall effect sensor to determine rotor speed and position, so it's more efficient and quieter. Now, the word synchronous in this name here indicates the rotor spins at the same speed as the magnetic field in the winding. So they're synced up. The big, it, the big advantages of that is power density and strong starting torque. So it's able to start it right up, have a good torque right away. Remember how I said torque pretty much in an instant. A main disadvantage of any EV motor with spinning permanent magnets is that it creates back electromotive force. So you get kind of a reverse force feeding back into the system. Uh, so when not powered at speed, which causes drag and heat that can demagnetize the motor. This motor type also sees some duty in power steering and brake systems. So manufacturers use it in other places other than just to drive the vehicle. But it has become the motor design of choice in most of today's battery electric and also hybrid vehicles as well. So that's fairly common out there as to what you're going to see. And then we talked about different flux, the, the uh, magnetic flux. So here's my magnetic poles here. And this is a uh, the standard type engine that we saw earlier. So that's what we call a radial flux. Most permanent magnet motors of all kinds orient their north-south axis perpendicular to the output shaft. So see how we have the north-south north, there and then the, the uh, other axis is, is the actual shaft itself. So this generates radial magnetic flux. There is a new class of axial flux motors that orients the magnets north-south axes parallel to the shaft. We see how they're facing the same way there usually on pairs of discs sandwiching safe stationary stator windings in between. Compact high torque axial flux orientation of these so-called pancake motors, so they're a little skinnier, can be applied to either brushless DC or these permanent magnet type systems. So the, this is the uh, newer technology here with the axial flux versus the radial flux of old. And then we also have the AC induction motor. So this is different than our permanent magnet motors. So we don't have permanent magnets in this type of motor. Um, and also the, the other value of that, not having those permanent magnets is we don't have to worry about the rare earth elements to make those magnets. So it, it can be lower in cost as well. And what we do is we keep the AC current flowing through the stator windings as in the motor that we just talked about. Standing in for the magnets is, this is actually a concept that Nikola Tesla patented in 1888. So as AC current flows through the various windings in the stator, the windings generate a rotating field of magnetic flux. So the magnetic field rotates. So we can see it kind of goes the, the uh, magnetic field lines here. Um, as these magnetic lines pass through perpendicular windings on the rotor, notice how they're perpendicular, they induce an electric current. This then generates another magnetic force that induces the rotor to turn. Because this force is only induced when the magnetic field lines cross rotor windings, the rotor will experience no torque or force if it rotates at the same speed, so synchronous. Uh, this means the AC induction motors are inherently asynchronous. Rotor speed is controlled by varying the alternating current's frequency. So we change the frequency of the AC going in there. We can see how they're uh, not synchronized. So that would be asynchronous. There. And there's our three phases of that AC going in there as well. Um, at light loads, the inverter controlling the motor can reduce voltage to reduce magnetic losses and improve efficiency. Depowering an induction motor during cruising when it isn't needed eliminates drag as well. Dual motor EVs using the permanent magnet system on both axles must always power all motors. This one, we can turn it off. Peak efficiency may be slightly greater for brushless DC or permanent magnet designs, but the AC induction motors often achieve higher average efficiency. Another small trade-off is slightly lower starting torque than the permanent magnet solution. Uh, the GM, early, early GM EV vehicles, and of course, Tesla, 
employs AC induction motors. It was that, that patented by Tesla type of motor. You would expect Tesla to use that, I would think, right? So uh, it just works a lot differently. Just it, it's no magnets. We don't have to worry about that. It's just AC inducing a current and inducing magnetism or a magnetic field into that uh, as it spins and it causes it to spin. So it's just a couple of cool little scientific facts going on with uh, some of these motors. Now you don't necessarily need to understand 100% how it all works, uh, but just know there's a couple of different types out there and they have their advantages and disadvantages, but they all run on AC when we're talking about uh, electric vehicles, at least nowadays. Some of the earlier ones, I guess, ran DC. But... Also, there is a unit in there. How do we know where the rotor is as it's spinning around? So as we saw on that, uh, on that last one, it knows where it is just because of the flux. But on a permanent magnet motor, we have this thing called a resolver, which is essentially a fancy Hall effect switch. Uh, so we have the rotor in there, and there, as the rotor uh, goes through the magnetic field, the computer can discern where in space or where in rotation this resolver is. So that's just an example from one of the manufacturers of a resolver, and uh, they have it just plugs in, and it, it knows where that rotor is as it's spinning around in time. So it's like a Hall effect switch. And if we wanted to see that, uh, there's a motor resolver plus and minus right here, goes into the traction motor, and then that feeds into the, um, into the module over here. So here's the motor itself. It's got a positive and negative resolver, so that's just an AC type waveform. And then we also have this uh, three-phase three electricity right here. So notice the three-phase AC high voltage, W, V, and U is what they call the different phases, just like on a brushless. DC motor, they call it the same type of thing. Uh, so just know you'd be dealing with that as well in there. And then on this particular vehicle, I, like I had mentioned, some vehicles, they just kind of do a direct drive. Other vehicles, like in this case, use a reduction gear. So it changes the motor speed and the torque. So it reduces the rotational speed of the engine down to the wheel speed. But also because of that, reducing this, the rotational speed, it helps to increase the torque to the wheels as well. And then we talk about the charger. So of course we know the high voltage battery on the vehicle must be charged. Uh, home chargers or charging stations can be used. And of course, regenerative braking also provides some charge as we mentioned before as well. Uh, there are also multiple competing charging standards. The world is trying to kind of get to one standard that you might go to a charging station and find two or three different plugs on one charging port. And then I know Tesla has their own and they also provide adapters for a couple of the other major ones as well. So just know that there are a few different charging standards. Uh, we also have the charger can do normal charging, like from your house would be maybe like a 110 would be a normal charger, kind of flows through one way. And then there's also quick chargers as well. If you think about like Tesla's supercharger can charge a vehicle really fast. There's other brands on the market as well. In this case, it goes through a separate quick charging set of uh, circuits. And we have some relays in there that allow it to quickly and pretty much just directly go into a high voltage battery instead of going through the onboard charging unit. And then here's just an example of the charger. If we, if we look up a schematic here, we can see it goes out to the uh, onboard charger there. We have the quick charge relays that we talked about, we just saw. Uh, we have our positive and negatives. We have bus bars in there. Uh, different terminal blocks with interlocks in there as well. Charging connector goes in this way. And we can see there's a lot of electronics and a lot of wiring going on in these vehicles. Uh, with the complexity of that though, uh, diagnosis is usually with a scanner. We're not usually gonna break out our scope to work on these high voltage systems, especially the high voltage systems. Um, high voltages do require caution, like we said before, special tooling work to work on many of the components and 12 volt systems can be diagnosed just like any other vehicle. Like I said before, your HVAC systems, your body control units, Things of that nature can be uh, diagnosed just like any other vehicle out there. Uh, and then, like I said, with component testing, we're usually not doing that. We're usually using the scanner. High voltages require that caution. And most high voltage systems are not suitable to test with an automotive scope anyways, because of the voltages that we're using and the types of signals. This is an example of a, a battery, not a main battery pack. And look at how many wires are in there. There's, there's multiple control modules inside the battery pack. And as I said, multiple batteries in there as well. So 
not really something we're going to be doing guided component testing or lab scoping. Um, really, we're going to be focusing on a lot of the diagnosis can be done through the scanner. And that's actually what the manufacturer recommends. Use this and look at these data PIDs to see what is going on inside that battery. Mode. So let's go live on the tool and look at a couple different things that I like to discuss here. So I got a 2019 Hyundai Kona electric. As I said, they have a, a gas and an electric version of the same car. They basically take that gas motor out, put the electric motor in the battery and all the other electronics in there, and you have an electric vehicle. So first thing I want to look at, so we're going to go into ShopKey and take a look at just a little bit of information that's in there. Just got to load the vehicle here. We'll call it a limited, fancy one. And I'm going to look up the high voltage battery, which would be my electric battery, the big old battery pack. TSBs, there are TSBs on this particular battery. There are some recalls in there for um, the traction battery. So could cause a fire is basically what this boils down to. Uh, an electrical short of lithium iron battery increases the risk of a fire. So they did a recall on that to inspect the systems to make sure they wouldn't cause a fire. That's generally a good thing, I think, to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, specifications is some interesting things in here. If we go down, as I think the battery pack assembly. So remember how I said we have multiple cells wired up in series. So 98 cell battery, uh, 98 battery cells. Uh, so it gives us a rated voltage of 352.8 volts. So how many volts per cell is that? Because I don't think it, oh, it does say cell voltage. Two and a half to 4.2 volts down there. Pack voltage range is 240 to 412. We want to have it at 350 or so. This one's interesting as well, weight. 445 kilograms or yeah 445 kilograms so how much is that 445 kilograms so let's see go to my calculator here let's see wait kilograms to pounds 445 kilograms is 981 pounds so almost a thousand pounds on this one battery pack in there that's 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 a lot of weight for that car Right, that's 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 like maybe half the weight of the vehicle right there, or maybe it adds the extra thousand pounds to a to a one ton vehicle. Uh, also, note down here: uh, use water cooling, force cooling of the cooling motor. Uh, also, to check this, notice how it says it can be checked with a via the diagnostic tool. Diagnostic tool. They're all asking for state of charge, cell voltage, pack voltage, uh, voltage deviation between the cells. We can see all of this with data pids on the scan tool because it has a, has a very smart uh, internal diagnosis that it can do. Uh, so we'll take a look at some of those PIDs in a little bit. Uh, for the actual resistance of the insulation, we can see uh, mega ohm tester in that case. And then the smaller battery is a little bit lighter, 325 kilograms, but still pretty much the same specs. We have all those specs there. The other interesting item I'd like to go to, uh, so you look at the wiring diagrams because this one's also kind of interesting. So we have an engine control circuit in here. So this is the battery control circuit right here. So if we go, I think we want to go left. Couple. So here's one of those batteries. All right, there's, there's my big old battery. I'm just going to get rid of some of these highlights. So if I go in, so there is a main battery module number five. So there's five different battery modules in here. And they go to each, uh, this control module, the wires that go to each of the battery, that's the smaller battery. Uh, there's module five in there, left, right hand and left, uh, module six on the, on the left hand and the right hand. There's multiple wires in here, as you can see, they're all wired individually pretty much to each battery cell. I just highlighted the whole thing by accident, that's okay. All right, and then we have more battery modules down here, control module units. Uh, so there's it, separate control modules for each section of the battery. And there's six different control modules in this particular battery. And this is the economical type. So that's not the extended range, that's a smaller battery. So there's even more in the larger battery there. So it's a lot of wiring, very complex internally. Uh, so that's another reason why we're not going to necessarily be breaking them apart and testing them, other than the fact that it's pretty dangerous to work with high voltage as well. But a lot of this stuff, like I said, can be done with the scanner. 
The last thing I want to talk about in shop key with this anyways, is going to be, I'm going to go back to my high voltage battery, uh, my parts, there you go, high voltage battery. High voltage battery on this vehicle can range anywhere from $10,360 to $33,315. That's like most of the cost of the vehicles there is tied up in just the battery on that. So we can actually pull up a diagram and take a look at that as well. Uh, so we can see the battery. It looks pretty small right there, but it is uh, it is uh, fancy and pricey to be sure. Also notice there's a battery cooling fan on this particular model as well. So this one doesn't have a coolant pump. This one has a cooling fan on it in this case. So yeah, like I said, heavy, 1,000 pound battery pack, $30,000 battery pack. That's 1,000 pounds. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, hopefully they don't fail very early on in the vehicle's life anyway. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll fail eventually. Now let's look at the scanner. So first off, before we even get into it, it says since electric and hybrid vehicles contain high voltage battery, if the high voltage systems or vehicles are handled incorrectly, it might lead to serious accidents, including electric shock. And we don't want that. We wanna make sure we're very safe. This is by no means a comprehensive electric vehicles uh, training course. It is a good overview, I think. Uh, we're not really diving too terribly deep into the nitty gritty of it. So just be aware that to work on these, you want some special training, specialer than this. All right, so let's go into system tests. We got electric water pump control in the motor control unit. Uh, there's also uh, some data in here we can look at in the motor control unit. So this will tell us, think about resolver calibration, right? We talked about the, diff the resolver in there it needs to be calibrated, uh, inverter temperatures, uh, there's another uh, motor resolver Alyssa Joust mag. So this is a magnetism gauge, I guess. Uh, cover interlock sensor. A uh, lot of different data can be had in here. Let's go look at the battery model. Oh, that's where all our voltages are. Uh, so battery management system. We go in here under system tests. We have a isolation breakdown detection function. So that's going to detect whether or not we have a breakdown of the insulation state of charge calibration and state of health calibration as well, which need to be done after certain functions on the vehicle. We go into data on the battery. We're gonna see we have the different currents, battery temperatures, min and max of different modules, separate out for temperatures as well. And then we have each cell voltage. So they need there's a spec for each voltage and the difference between the voltages uh, between the different cells. If we find a defective cell, they can be repaired. There's places that, that will disassemble battery cells and uh, replace separate ones. Um, so hopefully you don't have to pay $33,000 for a, for a new battery module. But um, definitely a lot of data to be having, as I said, with the scanner. That's what we're going to be doing most of our diagnosis on an electric vehicle, at least for the high voltage stuff. Uh, for the body control modules and HVAC things, we can still use our standard practices of guided component testing and things like that. So with that, that is my time. I actually went a little longer than planned, but that's okay. It's always a little bit extra. It's never hurt anybody, right? So let's talk about next week. So we are continuing with brand new classes. So this is week two. We got three more weeks of brand new classes before we start over again with the uh, first week, the last week. So next week is forced inductions. We're going to get into turbochargers, superchargers, blow-off valves, things like that. I'm going to talk about how they work how we can help uh, ease our diagnosis with them, common failures that we might see, et cetera. So once again, join me. We will be live next week. Uh, go to snapon.com slash OT to register for Zoom. We do six and nine Eastern on both, both of those on Zoom. The 6 p.m. Eastern goes to YouTube, youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics. If you are watching this on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe. Give us a thumbs up and uh, ring that little bell next to the subscribe button as well so you can get notified next time we go live or post a video. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, just leave a comment below if you have any questions as well. And uh, give me a follow on Facebook. If you wanna see any of our past sessions that we've done, past training sessions that we've done, uh, things like ADOS, guided component testing, data bus testing, uh, automatic transmission controls, et cetera. So we have 38 different episodes with more to come as, as we go. This is gonna be episode 39 added to the list. So. Once again, those are on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics and check that out. Now uh, for Q&A, as I said, this is pre-recorded this week because I'm on the road, but uh, if you do leave a comment 
if you have a question on Zoom, reply to the email that your confirmation email for Zoom, and I'll be able to reply to those through my email. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, just leave a comment under the video. And if you're watching on Facebook, just leave a comment under the video. And I reply to those comments as I have time being on the road. Before I go, though, I also want to mention my buddy Al, who also does live training three nights a week on different scan tools. So Monday's on Apollo, Wednesday's on Zeus, and Thursday's on Triton. Uh, so same time, 5 and 8 Central, 6 and 9 Eastern. If you go to snapon.com slash OT, you can register and reserve your seat for Zoom. Al only does them on Zoom. He doesn't simulcast to YouTube or anything because uh, it, it's meant to be more of kind of a, you're sitting there with the tool in front of you. If you have any questions, you can ask them right then and there. And uh, it just makes it a little easier just containing that to Zoom. So he goes through basically everything soup to nuts on the tool, goes through, let's set up your Wi-Fi, let's set up your free Snap on Cloud account. Let's walk through code to completion on uh, going through fast track intelligent diagnostics. How does it help me as a technician help that help me diagnose cars faster? That, and that's the goal, right? Time is money. Uh, so that's the first hour. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, since the Zeus and Triton also have scope and meter functions, he goes through the scope, the meter, the guided component tester, a few real world examples of where you might be able to use it in the shop tomorrow, uh, talks through a, a bunch of different tests that we can do and, and how to use it better. So Al is a deep well of Snap-on Diagnostics knowledge. So definitely go check him out. Once again, snapon.com slash OT to sign up for those Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday, depending on the tool you want training on. And with that, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy week. Come spend a little bit of time with me. Hopefully we got a little bit more information on electric vehicles. I know there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, definitely get as much training as you can before we try to work on those vehicles. And we always want to remember to stay safe on those vehicles. So with that, enjoy the rest of your week. Hopefully we'll see you next week for force induction. Have a good evening. Take care.